Brett, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about the Unity 2020 plan, uh, which maybe some people watching this will have already been aware of. But I want to do it from a perspective that viewers of uh, Rebel Wisdom and probably viewers of your podcast will be familiar with, which is this idea of the Game B and Game A dynamic. Game A being the current system, and there's all sorts of game theoretic traps. There are, there are traps, for example, the race to the bottom, uh, the tragedy of the commons. You've outlined that a lot in a lot of your previous work. And there's a group of people uh, that have been looking at society through that framework and saying, okay, the entire source code of this game A structure is self-terminating in many ways. And you can look at the choices that have been presented in the 2020 election as evidence of this system becoming more and more dysfunctional. And then game B is a placeholder for a different system. Like there's all sorts of game B projects and they, the, the main features they have is that they deal with some of the traps of a game A system. Given that, would you describe Unity 2020 as a game B project? It's certainly an attempt to create a, a game B project in political space. It is obviously built to defeat the duopoly on the duopoly's home turf. So almost by definition, this is a game B. Whether or not it can succeed and whether it is long-term stable is harder to tell. I would say one thing that is very clear from the inside of the unity movement is just how much the duopoly is depending on its ability to bar competitors from the landscape. As you point out in uh, your introduction to Unity, the major parties have delivered us offerings that are absolutely preposterous and would seem to leave those parties open to challenge from anybody who could muster a better ticket. But the obstacles to doing so are um, absolutely ferocious. And that is the question. Can something like Unity that is structurally built to defeat the arguments that prevent uh, anything from outside of the duopoly from functioning, is that new structure sufficient to break in? Could you summarize what you think of the game B dynamics and the game A dynamics that this is kind of designed to deal with? Sure. Um, the first thing I would say is that this election in the U.S. is revealing that the key feature that allows the major parties to survive is their ability to bar entry to anything that has the capacity to challenge them. So on the Democratic side in particular, we're seeing a party that refuses to articulate any positive vision, refuses to advance candidates that catalyze the imagination, and is running entirely on the argument that it is the only reasonable vote in light of the opposition. So that is not a strong position electorally. It is, in fact, very easy to come up with candidates who do catalyze the imagination, to come up with policies that are popular, to come up with strategies that are more nimble. What is impossible to do is to get a seat at the table which would allow you to compete head to head with the feeble uh, offerings of the major parties. So first and foremost, Unity is a project that attacks the primary obstacle to what are typically described as third party offerings. Now, Unity is not a party, but nonetheless, it runs up against the bulwark that is designed to prevent other parties from challenging the duopoly. And that that primary weapon is the argument that if your values are over here and you marshal a third party that's over here, you will rob the major party that's closer to your values and empower the one that's farther away. So what you do will be counterproductive because you will elect the greater evil. The key dynamic inside of the unity proposal is that we take a uh, a draftee from the left and a draftee from the right and we bring them together under an agreement that they would rule by consensus. And so you can't place unity on the political spectrum because it's apolitical, it's non-ideological. And because of that, 
the argument that you will empower the greater evil by deploying this strategy and therefore are morally required not to deploy it, that argument falls flat for anybody who's tracking the analytics. Now, interestingly, although the analytics fail, many people are emotionally so wrapped up in the idea that somehow this will spoil an election that they won't even allow themselves to contemplate the idea. So they have been traumatized by the major parties. They've watched people like Ralph Nader and Jill Stein be demonized as the spoilers that elected the greater evil, and they don't want responsibility. So even though it is irrational to fear unity on this basis, people still do, at least some of them. So just to kind of outline it, it's two candidates, uh, ideally one from the right, one from the left, who are, who are kind of in joint, making joint decisions through consensus. How is that consensus enforced? Wouldn't the president, because once they, if, if they win, there's a coin toss and then the president is chosen that way. How, how do you avoid the fact that the situation that the president just has the kind of veto power over those decisions? Um, well, I would say, first of all, let me just correct one thing. They're not candidates. What we have are potential draftees. This is phrased uh, as a draft very intentionally because one of the things that we needed to accomplish was um, that the offerings had to not be limited to those people who were, um, let's say, independent of the bulwark created by the duopoly. That is to say, the best candidates had to be chosen from the full menu. And that meant that we couldn't seek their, uh, we couldn't ask them to run in advance of choosing who we ideally wanted to draft. So in essence, what we did was we ran a, a poll to figure out who ideally we wanted to see inhabit the office. And our hope was that having been drawn from right and left, the constituency of unity, which voted on who we wish to draft, would choose people with the capacity to work across um, a political divide and the instinct to do it. And we didn't know if it would work, but what we discovered was that it did. We got six um, people were nominated for our draft and three came from the left, three came from the right. We then ran a ranked choice vote to see which ordering people preferred these tickets in. The top choice turned out to be Tulsi Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw. Now it turns out Tulsi Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw are friends. They are from opposite parties. They quite like each other and have no trouble working productively together. So the answer to your question is that our guess at what one would have to do in order to find the ability to reach consensus worked beautifully. And we couldn't be happier um, that this ticket is the one that rose to the top. Have, have they agreed to, to be part of it? Uh, no, and in fact, I would counsel them not to agree. The fact is these are the best people we have in our system. And because we are patriotic Americans, we want them strong irrespective of whether or not this is in a unity context or in their present context. So the, the nature of the draft is that we have to deliver them um, something that would justify their taking the risk of partnering with us. And that has not happened yet, but our hope is that it will over the coming weeks. I, I've been thinking about a kind of a good definition of game A and game B. And one of the, I think one of the most compelling visions of that is the, the series, The Wire. Are you familiar with that? The, the David Simon series? It is my favorite piece of television ever. What I love about that is that it demonstrates that almost all of these power systems create these compromises, create these kind of boxed in uh, situations, whether you're part of the police force or whether you're part of a drug gang, you are no, not free because of the, the nature of those systems. Uh, I think that's an, an excellent analysis. And by going through um, one area after another, doing this by season, it highlighted the fact that it was basically the game theory ruling each of these, uh, each of these dynamics. So yeah, it's a perfect analogy. If we use that as a kind of definition of game A, for me, it's a perfect example. And it, it uses game theory to explain why 
you're no you're not free for all of these different reasons within these different systems um for for me it's interesting to look at the situation that we're in and in some ways trump did break the duopoly he came as an outsider from outside the republican party and would you would you agree with that and i i think it's really interesting to look at trump as for me a kind of herald of the end of game a like he seems to be a product of the end of game a he's kind of like a zero trust environment he's kind of the prisoner's dilemma made flesh for me as a yeah. kind of in a game theoretic sense it's like if if you devote yourself to anything bigger than you, yourself you're a sucker as we saw recently with the with the comments about the, the the kind of the armed forces like he just doesn't get the idea of anything bigger than himself which i'd like to follow this thread a little bit but what would you what would you say to that First of all, I would say he absolutely was a successful challenge to the duopoly. He decapitated the GOP. And so one of the reasons that um, explaining where we are is difficult is that we are challenging the duopoly, but the duopoly has already been um, reformed by Trump, who demonstrated that it was possible. So unfortunately, for the reasons you just outlined, it was not a highly useful demonstration in the sense of what followed. The payload of what was carried in um, in place of the previous power structure has been, um, well, maybe it's even generous to say a mixed bag. But the proof of concept that it is possible was very powerful. And, you know, I think what we saw in 2016 was a real challenge to both sides of the duopoly in the form of Bernie Sanders on the left and Donald Trump on the right. Now, Bernie Sanders almost made it, but his constraints were greater. As you point out, Bernie Sanders, well, you don't point this out about Bernie, but you point out Trump doesn't have obligation to things larger than himself, and um, that frees him maximally to do whatever is necessary to move forward. Bernie Sanders is um, committed to certain moral principles and as such, in the end, he fell on his sword in a, what I think is a mistaken attempt to, to adhere to those principles. But nonetheless, the democratic side of the duopoly has been more successful at preventing insurgents from breaking its stranglehold, leading to the absolutely absurd 2020 situation of two candidates, neither of which inspire anyone with no proposal about how to make things better, and one of them clearly evidencing signs of cognitive failure. I mean, if you wrote this as a script, people wouldn't buy it. It's not even plausible, and yet here we are. And what's your concern if Trump wins then? Oh, I have tremendous concerns if Trump wins. For one thing, the what we have unfolding in the US, and really I think in the West uh, at a larger scale, is a competition between two narratives, both of which are wrong. And the unrest in the American streets is predicated on the idea that white supremacy is rampant and riddled throughout our system, that it hides behind every corner, that it is in every white mind. That's obvious nonsense, but the fact of that accusation now being leveled and with quite a bit of stigmatizing power uh, level leveled against anybody who resists it this is going to drive white people together it's going to drive the very racism that is claimed to exist already and that racism will find safe harbor in a uh, trumpian GOP milieu where it hasn't been at home in some time. The way that the media frames Trump sort of seems to be as kind of orange Hitler, like he's got some kind of big authoritarian plan. And I think people sense that that's not probably not true because Trump doesn't have any kind of a plan. But my concern is that the nature of Trump's psychology could lead him in that direction through pure naked self-interest. And because there's a, a tremendous opportunity that will be generated by the lunacy on the left. A couple of years ago, I put out a video. I think the title of it was Speak of the Devil. And it was about this very process where in leveling false accusations about 
um, the degree of white supremacy, for example, in the U.S., that the foolishness on the Democratic side would cause people on the Republican side to begin to view the world in exactly those terms. And it would create a revival of um, white racism in the U.S. that has been uh, close to flickering out for several decades now. So I have this fear exactly that a, an opportunist uh, like Trump will find himself behaving in exactly the way that he has been accused of planning and clearly wasn't planning. We're now almost four years into um, the Trump presidency and uh, it hasn't been a case of the rise of a new Hitler and the left has not admitted this, which it really, it's about time that it did. And it also points to something I think that uh, certainly Eric has talked about and perhaps you've talked about as well, is that the sense of all of the opportunity being hoarded by a certain generation. I mean, you look at now, everyone was born in the 1940s. It's basically the baby, bo baby boomer generation refusing to give up power. What do you make of that dynamic? Well, I think Eric has been right to point out, even just at the level of noticing the pattern, the shocking concentration of wealth and power in this now dwindling generation. I think it's part of a larger dynamic, though. Essentially, what we have is a system that has, through an evolutionary process, turned into one that amplifies and perpetuates existing distributions of well-being. And so what really has happened, I think, is not that the boomers have conspired against the future. It's that anything that is powerful has been given um, impressive tools with which to not uh, pass the torch. And that works racially, that works generationally, it works uh, at all kinds of levels. And the fact of these two geriatric candidates running is a manifestation of that larger process. Mm. And what do you make, I, I remember on a, on a recent live stream with Heather, you both talked about how um, you were equally, that there was sort of Trump, de, Trump delusion syndrome often on the left, but there was an equivalent on, on the right where some people just wouldn't hear criticism of him. Uh, and you were equally kind of uh, concerned about both. I, I wonder, I mean, as I look at the, the election, the way I look at it with, I just can't see if Trump is the, the sort of the, the herald of the end of game A, like it, he's, he's the kind of the, the ultimate boss of that kind of dysfunctional way of doing things. I, I just don't see aesthetically from a sort of storyline perspective, it just doesn't make any sense that we're going to go back to an Obama era Democrat. It's just like, it, I, I just can't see it happening. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the next stage is, but it doesn't look good for all sorts of different reasons. And it just seems, it just seems almost impossible that, that it, it could be a, a Biden victory just from a sort of a sense of the story arc of where we've been and where we're going. I absolutely agree with this. I mean, I believe we are staring at the collapse of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has effectively announced that there's nothing left in the tank. And I don't know why anybody is imagining that an entity that performed this badly in terms of nominating candidates to defeat what they claim is, you know, this historic evil, right? The fact that it would, that it would advance such a feeble ticket is proof positive that it has no idea where to go. And I think the way it is handling the unrest in the U.S. is equally strong evidence. This is a recipe for electoral disaster. They're going to lose to Trump if something like unity does not swoop in and allow something reasonable to happen. And uh, from my perspective, it is frustrating to see people conclude that um, the Democrats are right there in the hunt, I think on the basis that they typically always are. And I think people are just failing to look at the evidence in front of them. Well, you could argue, I mean, they are ahead in the polls and have been quite substantially for a while. Um, I don't know why anyone finds that comforting in light of 2016, 
What we know is that there is incredible pressure for people not to say that they are considering voting for Donald Trump and that when they end up voting, many of the people who swear they're not going to do that do anyway. And their reason to do it in this circumstance is um, becoming more rational in light of the threat posed to average Americans by unrest in the streets. The fact is the Democrats have effectively announced a, an unwillingness to address this problem. It really is threatening people in their homes, and um, that is going to result in people voting for the one thing that they think might protect them. So uh, a loss for the Democrats is perfectly predictable here. And in light of that loss, given what people on the left believe about Trump, you would imagine that this would make them receptive to anybody who was offering something coherent uh, in his stead. And yet um, there is this, I would argue, sheepish tendency to simply imagine that what has been is what will be. And we know that that's, you know, that's rule of thumb at best. And history doesn't work that way. New things happen and they take over. And Trump was one and Sanders was one. And here we are in 2020 staring at an absolutely unprecedented uh, competition between two tickets that don't look like anything that has preceded them. So something unprecedented is about to happen. And the fact that people imagine that unprecedented thing will be as precedented as possible is uh, it's a failure of imagination. And there have been a few um, practical criticisms of the, the unity plan, like about ballot access in particular, that it was launched very uh, too late to get people onto the ballot. Well, we, we wouldn't have been proceeding with this if there wasn't a mechanism for doing it. And this again shows that uh, people are overly obligated to their models of how things are done. And the fact is the duopoly has blocked every normal mode that you might use to challenge them. So by definition, any successful challenge will have to be abnormal. Now, what people expect is, oh, if you're going to get on the ballot, what you do is you collect huge numbers of signatures. You have to do so in every state and that that is, you know, it requires a, a gigantic effort just to gain viability. On the other hand, we have numerous parties that are not in and of themselves viable. We have two major ones and many minor ones, and uh, they have ballot access, which they are free to allocate. And so in a moment where Americans are actually fleeing cities that they live in, moving to places that they feel that violence is less likely to reach them, that's an emergency moment. And the question is, can these third parties that have ballot access recognize that not only is it the patriotic thing to do to join together under a unity banner and do something that might electorally succeed, but it is also in their interest to do it that the duopoly is their enemy and defeating it is in their interest, um, you know, in general ways, but also very specific ones. Any party that gains 5% in the election gets federal funds in the next cycle. That's a very substantial advantage that they would have. It's also true that Unity has already displayed a commitment to ranked choice voting, which is a mechanism that would greatly enhance the power of third parties to bring coherence to our national discussion. So joining with Unity makes a good deal of sense for um, any third party, and there are numerous ways it could happen. The simplest way would be for the Greens or Libertarians to see the wisdom in this plan and to, to join with us. Um, but there are many other parties, and it's, there, there are many paths to the ballot in all 50 states. When you first pitched the, the plan, the unity plan, you mentioned the two names that came to mind at first were Andrew Yang and William McRaven. And that seemed to make quite a lot of sense in terms of uh, a, a military figure coming in. I think he was a university president before. Uh, Chancellor of the University of Texas. Yeah, so you're sort of coming from slightly outside politics and, and coming in. That seemed to make a lot of sense. When the, when the choice shifted to, to Tulsi and Dan Crenshaw, for me, that seemed to make less sense because they are political figures. They're within the, the, the parties. 
and I, I would argue are sort of subject to the same kind of game A forces that, that everyone else is subject to. Crenshaw has to, is thinking about a run potentially in 2024. There are, he, he's kind of in that, in that game. Like I, I have to say, I, I was, it, it, it changed the nature of it for me when, when, those, when those names were announced. Well, I understand that. I have to say, I think uh, we have already demonstrated something very powerful with Unity 2020. And we demonstrated it by running a completely, um, how can I put it, a completely successful mechanized attempt to count the will of our constituents and put it into action. Can I take that back? That was not well said. I have to figure out some better way of saying it. Okay. Um, the unity movement is composed of a great many volunteers who are engaged in the process of making it happen and a much larger group of people who are paying attention to the movement and interested in what it does. And in running this vote, we did not meddle with the will of our constituents. So what happened was they had the ability to nominate potential draftees and then to vote on them. And the only thing we did was eliminate people we didn't th think met the unity criteria. So what happened was Tulsi Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw rose to the top in a perfectly natural process. And I must say, I am quite pleased with the ticket. I find the fact that these figures genuinely are from two different sides of the political spectrum, that they have genuine respect for each other. Each one has displayed a great deal of courage and patriotism. And uh, the the pairing of them does seem to create a natural balance. As for them being too much within the system, I would say I personally have had several interactions now with Dan Crenshaw, and although he and I are on very different parts of the political spectrum, we have no trouble um, finding common ground and seeing the humanity in each other, so I believe the individual is quite up to the challenge. And um, in Tulsi's case, she has faced absolutely um, diabolical challenges from her own party, the worst of which being Hillary Clinton's alleging that she was a Russian asset during the primaries. So this team is one that has awareness of just how toxic these parties can be and has an instinct to, um, to act in the nation's interest irrespective of what the parties think. And I'm very happy with the ticket. Would I have been happy with Yang and McRaven? I would have been. The reason I named them when I first unveiled the proposal was that I thought highly of them both and I saw that they had the potential to do the same thing. Um, but uh, Gabbard and Crenshaw seems to me a perfectly viable unity ticket. And what's more, when one compares it to the offerings that the major parties have provided, there's simply no contest. And I, I don't want to concentrate or stay too long on either of the figures because that's not the, the point of the conversation. But um, Crenshaw, for example, and I'm just I'm just taking his his um, actions here. He posted on Facebook a while ago that Trump was an idiot, whose rhetoric was insane and hateful, and has then flipped round to actually being one of Trump's most kind of ardent defenders. Like for me, that illustrates the problem with the game A system. I'm not I'm not making that as a comment about him specifically. But the, the forces are pushing someone like Crenshaw, who's got a political ambition to run in 2024, 20, towards supporting someone who he probably actually does not uh, align with on many levels. Like, it just seems to be a much bigger game theoretic trap than, than any of us, than, than is able to be dealt with by this plan. On the contrary, um, the fact is, yes, Dan Crenshaw has said some things that uh, don't fit with what I think a completely free actor would say, given what I am certain he believes. That is to say, he's a smart guy and he is playing a political game because that's the system he's in. But I would say one of the things back in the, uh, the days when Game B was first being 
formulated. I did a lot of thinking about what game A is composed of. And there are three kinds of actors in our system. There are those who will do the right thing no matter what. These people are not powerful because they they uh, are too obligated to principle to be successful. And although I admire them, we don't see them very frequently inside of the system. We have people who will do what is in their self-interest no matter what at any cost to others. We see a fair number of those. And then we have people who are reluctant participants in game A, who given a game B option would take it. And so if we're going to judge all of the people in the system who are successfully playing the game A game, if we're gonna judge them for having touched game A, then all hope is lost. If we are going to provide a better option and then allow them to jump ship from game A into something that aspires to a much better outcome on game theor theoretically sound basis, then there's a lot of hope. And so I am quite confident having interacted with Dan Crenshaw that although he's a very successful game A player, that given a better game, he'd be glad to play that one and he would do very well in it. I think his instincts are the right ones. I'm not going to fault him for um, playing a strategically wise game inside of Washington because frankly that's what has him there and I'm glad that he's in the room because I know that his instinct is to protect the nation and we need it. And in those three categories you just laid out, how would you describe yourself? Because the, 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 the story of Evergreen would suggest that you were someone who would kind of say what he believed no matter what. Do you, do you see yourself as someone who occasionally collaborates, occasionally stands up, or are you, which category do you put yourself? Well, what I would point out is that first of all, whether I have gotten somewhere or not gotten somewhere is dependent on which metric you use. Game A does a tremendous job of ignoring the world of podcasters, let's say, right? It did a very poor job handling the Evergreen story. What made the Evergreen story resonate for people were outsiders who didn't even have a seat at the table in Game A. You know, Mike Nana's documentary shocked people. It was brilliantly done. But Mike Nana is not with a major outfit. He's a freelancer from Australia, born in Mauritius, right? This is um, a very different kind of player. So to the extent that game B is rising on the outskirts of game A, um, I've done all right. And I don't think that's surprising. You would expect a game B player to play well in game B. And as I've pointed out elsewhere, Game A and Game B are always in competition. Now it happens that Game A has been so dominant for so long that we view it as the entirety of things, but there's always um, limited venues in which Game B shines. And I would say those limited venues are becoming more public because of the fragility of Game A, which is finally showing. Um, so yes, I have succeeded, but I don't think I've succeeded in the sense that uh, I'm winning within game A. I'm winning on the outskirts of game A at best um, over in a place where game B values are held. And I don't think that should surprise anyone. I'd like to bring in a couple more topics that I've been thinking about a lot and I know that you've been thinking about as well and um, issues that affect all of us who are kind of operating in this kind of alternative sense-making space. I, I saw a live stream with you and Heather a while ago where it's mostly Heather talking about how you, the, the algorithms had been categorizing your content in a certain way. And this sense of being, um, I, I'd say that, that you, you want to appear or you want to, to, to present a perspective that's kind of nuanced and is not right and is not left, but that you were being kind of drawn towards one side of the spectrum rather than the other. Where do you think you've ended up? And what do you think the dangers are of, of the kind of algorithmic manipulation of this space? Well, let's be very clear. In, in being drawn somewhere, this is really a matter of the portrayal. 
that the algorithm portrays you as one way or the other based on the incentives of the corporations that are deploying these algorithms. I think we have been very successful at resisting the temptation to feed the audience that is finding our content. That is to say, there were years where people who were arriving at our doorstep were typically right of center, and there was a lot of insistence that we were being so-called red-pilled, and that we would wake up to the conservative reality of the world, and that would complete the story. And the fact is we haven't moved to the right, even though um, there was a niche for us to do so. There w it would have been financially rewarding, for example, to acknowledge the truth of conservatism and be heralded on that side. But instead, the, the honest thing to do was to say that actually this story isn't a clear victory for conservatism, even if reason is finding safe harbor on the conservative side at the moment. Um, but you can't beat the algorithm. For one thing, you can't see it. And for another thing, it's not stable. The algorithm is changing, it's a moving target. So even if your detectors were um, unusually capable of figuring out what the algorithm was doing and in some way correcting for its effect, the fact that it changes over time makes that job impossible. So we are in, in some sense enslaved to its view of the world and what it does among presumably many things is it feeds people things that they either want to hear or that will enrage them enough to keep them focused. And both of those processes are absolutely toxic to sense-making. Sense-making requires, it doesn't require that you have perfect access to the world, but it does require um, a, a, a relatively um, useful signal-to-noise ratio that allows you to detect the signal and to process it. And the problem is there is signal in the distortion that the algorithm introduces. It's signal about what Google, for example, wants. The fact that the algorithms are serving the economic and possibly political interests of those who are deploying them is absolutely toxic to sense making. It does not allow you to view the world. It's like we've purchased glasses from somebody that wants us to see certain things and not see other things. And we have to take the glasses off, but our means for doing that is essentially non-existent. Because we don't know what the glasses are doing, which distortions they are introducing, and when, it is impossible to correct for them. And I believe that this is actually creating a literal derangement of civilization. That what we are seeing in the streets, for example, is effectively a group psychosis that is born of an incorrect understanding of events. And if left to continue, this trajectory will be utterly devastating to Western civilization and possibly beyond. And I think that comes back to the nature of the filter bubble and to the nature of the algorithms. So basically, if you're a Black Lives Matter supporter, your, your Facebook feed, which is just an infinite scroll of stuff that is designed to push your buttons looks completely different from a Trump supporter's Facebook feed. And there just seems like there, is, there, are no, there are now no places where those two worlds overlap. And that is just increasingly kind of leaking out into the, into the real world. Well, I wouldn't say no places. I think there are islands. And I think uh, Rebel Wisdom is one such island. I think Dark Horse Podcast and The Portal are other islands. But I know that personally, I seek out both narratives and I compare them. And I'm sure that I am not doing a perfect job of seeing them, but I'm doing enough of a job that I understand that I'm being lied to in two different directions. And that does not lead to a whole lot of certainty about exactly what is going on, but it does lead to proper skepticism of what we are told is going on. Something that has changed since we last spoke is we've seen what looks like, and I covered it in the sense making series. Uh, Matt Taibbi, in particular, has sort of said a bit of a mea culpa. Uh, obviously, this was much worse than we realized. We were kind of silent on this. 
You've also had Glenn Greenwald starting to, to speak out on it, both sort of stalwarts of the left. Matt Iglesias also kind of raising concerns. Do you see those, those sort of signs of hope as potentially quite important? Like for me, it does feel like there's, there's beginning to be a bit of a, of a change within the left, especially around the, the people starting to spot that there is a danger of this sort of ideological um, framework that's been nurtured on the left. There's certainly a degree of hope in it. I'm, I'm pleased to see people waking up, but I'm also frustrated because the key thing about recognizing that you had it wrong is figuring out why you had it wrong so that you don't get it wrong the next time. And there are some people that I think are doing this job as well as possible. Um, Matt Taibbi would be a, a great example. And then there are others who just want, now that they have figured out that they had it wrong, they just want to simply inhabit the right position and now they're the new experts. And the point is, nope, you actually blew it. And the discovery that you blew it now means you need to study the process that misled you so that you understand what that error was made of. And in the case of, for example, Matt Iglesias, I don't see that. I don't see the self-skepticism that should have been caused by the discovery that he had it wrong. So it's a mixed bag. Um, and I hope we can get to this process because ultimately the cost of having been wrong in this case is gargantuan. Yeah, I mean, it does seem to me just from the last three months or so that there has been a change. I mean, the Harper's letter was also... I know I think I, I think you you maybe have a slightly different take on that, but for me it was a it was a line, it was a sort of very tenuous line in the sand, but the response to it showed the problem. And you did have a huge number of people signing that letter. And I think the response in the aftermath showed the issue. You can argue with the wording of the letter, and I think you would have worded it differently. But for me, it was strong enough for people to get behind, and then the aftermath really demonstrated what the issue was. I, I saw you discuss it and said that you wouldn't have signed it. Um, do you look at it differently at all now? No, I think the letter evidences exactly the Matty Iglesias problem, which is that people who got it wrong are now looking to carve out a new deal that protects them rather than recognize that they put a lot of us in jeopardy and that that jeopardy is their responsibility. And it's not that everyone who signed the letter is in that boat. My biggest concern about the letter was that it dragged people who have been very far-sighted on this question, like Jonathan Haidt, in with people like Matty Iglesias, and then it excluded others. Um, so those who had this right should be the ones pointing the direction to go so we don't make the mistake again, rather than grouping people who are still um, understood to be part of polite society and excluding those who were demonized by them. So the IDW, for example, was portrayed as some sort of far-right, alt-right, this, that, or the other. That portrayal was absolute nonsense, and that stigma is still in force. That stigma is the reason that no one from IDW was invited to sign that letter. Just returning to the, um, the Unity 2020 plan, it relies on a groundswell of support. You've made that clear. At what point do you need that groundswell of support to happen? And when, at what point will you uh, decide whether it has or hasn't? Uh, it needs to happen very soon. Now, there's a question. We have a lot of things which might, if one of the things that we need were to fall into place, it would catalyze the others. And so there's sort of a question of... Uh, what is the first cause here? But yes, it has to happen very soon in order for it to be a plausible plan. I won't say more than that because the details of exactly when depend on how events unfold and they also depend on the decisions of individual states with respect to their ballots. And could, could you talk more about what those things are that you think might catalyze that process? I can't because they are in motion and I don't my primary objective is to give this plan the maximum chance of functioning in the 2020 cycle and discussing the exact details of how it might unfold and what is in motion is 
uh, clearly a hazard to the plan. So in the interests of Unity 2020, I'm going to um, leave it at that. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>